Mm-hmm. All right. We should be live for our three o'clock live stream. If you can hear me, if you can see me okay, leave me a comment, leave me a like, let me know that you guys are um, seeing me and hearing me okay. I'll pull this up so I can see our comments. And mute that so you don't have to double hear me. All right, I see we've got some comments coming in. Um, this is gonna be a little bit different than what we do normally. So um, you might notice the acoustics are a little bit different. Um, and that is because I am actually not out at our site today. I am broadcasting to you for our live stream um, from my home office um, in McKinleyville. So um, it is very rainy outside today. My hope was to do this program from out in the field, but um, I wanna show you guys a video today about some of the plankton and macroinvertebrates that I collected on Wednesday. So if you guys did tune in for our live stream on Wednesday, you saw me collect this sample live. I curated kind of a video um, from some of the things I found. So what I want to share with you guys today is that video. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the organisms um, that I found. And if you have any questions about them, we will, of course, be answering those. So without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and play this video for you guys. Again, this is from the sample that I collected on Wednesday. So if you were here for the live stream on Wednesday, um, you're going to see some of the same organisms that we looked at on Wednesday. These are macroinvertebrates and plankton that we're going to be looking at. And um, that was collected at Prairie Creek Redwood State Park. Just give me one moment to get this queued up and get this video going. Pardon my messy desktop. My name is Kyle and I work for California State Parks and today I'm out at Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park. This is in Redwood State National Park on the far north coast of California. So macroinvertebrates are not just an important part of a trout diet, but also can help us tell the health of a stream or just about any body of water. In just a moment, I'm gonna grab a sample from this creek right here. This is Prairie Creek in Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park. We're gonna take a look at what organisms are living in this stream right here. Before we begin, it's important to understand what a macroinvertebrate is. So this word is basically two parts, macro and invertebrate. So macro is anything that you can see with your naked eyes. So without using a microscope or a magnifying glass, you can see these things. Invertebrates are any organism that does not have a backbone. So if you feel your back right now, you'll feel little bumps along your spine. Those are called your vertebrae, and that's what makes you a vertebrate. All the organisms that we're looking at today don't have a backbone. They have, might have some other type of skeleton, and many of them have their skeletons on the outside, exoskeletons, but they don't have a backbone like you or me. So today I'm going to be collecting my sample with a D-net or a dip net. And you can see this has a really fine mesh so that way any macroinvertebrates aren't going to be able to slip through it. Some of the organisms that you'll look for to have a healthy stream are um, things like caddisfly larva, uh, mayfly nymphs, uh, dragonfly nymph, um, stonefly nymph. These are um, organisms that are essentially, um, these are baby versions of things you might see flying around. So when we say we use the macroinvertebrates to determine the health of the stream, what we're essentially doing is looking at the ecosystem that these organisms prefer. What we're looking at is the organisms who are picky about their environment and prefer the same environment that trout do or that the fish do. Generally, these are considered sensitive organisms that if there's any big change in their environment, they're not gonna be able to deal with that. Inversely, what we see in an unhealthy stream, we see a lot of organisms that are generalists, organisms that don't necessarily mind what kind of ecosystem they're living in. Part of the reason that macroinvertebrates are so helpful is they have a relatively short lifespan. So we're able to see any change in an environment um, relatively quickly and how that affects generations of this organism. So if there's any change in this ecosystem, we're able to take a look at the organisms living here and the species that live here will shift pretty rapidly if there's a big change in the environment. Seeing the organisms in this stream does not only tell us that this is a healthy stream, but also means that this ecosystem can support fish like trout because they're food sources here. And that's incredibly important. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with me and my bugs. Let's say bye to all of our buggy friends.
All right. So that was just a, a short little video to kind of show off um, some of the things that we found while we were while we were um, looking around Perry Creek in the stream. So I'm just going to let this video play. This is just um, some extra footage that I got off of there. Actually, this is not going to work because I want to look at your comments. So let's go back and do this. All right. All right, there we go. So let's see if you guys have any questions here. Um, <laughs> Bud noticed the quarantine beard. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> All right, let's see. So people were hearing me loud and clear. That's excellent, awesome, can hear me, excellent. Excellent. So um, something I wanted to um, point out with looking at these organisms is some of the incredible adaptations that many of them employ to um, survive here. So a lot of the kind of main organisms that we see in um, a stream and can help us determine this stream health are things that do a incomplete metamorphosis. So there is many creatures that live in Prairie Creek that start their life off living in the creek and they eventually come out. Um, some of the most common organisms that we see are caddisfly larvae, which turn into caddisfly, um, mayfly nymphs, which turn into mayfly, dragonfly nymphs, which turn into dragonflies, and stonefly nymphs that turn into, guess what, stoneflies. So many of them kind of start their life process in the water and eventually emerge or come out through a type of metamorphosis. Now, what's really different between these organisms metamorphosis and the metamorphosis we see with butterflies is that most of these creatures don't create cocoons. Instead, they kind of go through multiple molts where they shed their exoskeletons as they get bigger and eventually come out. So this little clip right here, um, this is a caddisfly and this caddisfly has made sort of a chrysalis or cocoon out of, um, out of rocks. And caddisflies are one of the organisms that do kind of create a cocoon or a chrysalis. So this is one that has used um, rocks and pebbles from the bottom of the stream to create its um, kind of cocoon. And then we have another one you can see kind of towards the end here. Now this, this caddisfly has used a, a kind of a, a stick that was already hollow and just has gone inside to kind of make that its home. So one of the really cool things about these creatures is again, that we can look at, um, we can look at certain organisms to determine the health of the stream. So they are food for the fish that lives here, but some of them are more sensitive to their environments than others. So um, stonefly are one of the most sensitive. And I just recently learned that that's because that they, they don't have a lot of gills. So the oxygen content in the water needs to be just right in order for them to survive. And this sample that we collected on Wednesday had tons of stoneflies. Um, this creature right here that we have paused um, right next to the more spider looking thing where it has these kind of three circles on it, that's a stonefly. And we saw tons of them. And that's a really good indicator that that's a healthy stream. And the way that this food chain works, essentially, what are these, what are these tiny, tiny creatures eating? If they're being eaten by salmon, what are they feeding on? So um, this starts with the plankton and it starts with uh, phytoplankton, which are plant-based plankton. And they're generally tiny, tiny organisms that are floating around in the water and they're photosynthesizing just the same as plants on land do to create their own food. Then you have zooplankton, which are animal-based plankton eating those phytoplankton. And generally they're a little bit bigger. And then those are getting bigger and bigger until you get into this group of macroinvertebrates, which are essentially um, babies of things that will eventually grow up and come out of the water. And they get drastically bigger. And this is actually a great clip right here for an example of that. This is actually three mayfly right here. And we saw this on, this is from our clip on Wednesday. Um, this large organism is a type of mayfly. This fuzzy kind of looking organism is a type of mayfly. And then this tiny, tiny one in the top left corner is also a mayfly. And while um, these might be different species, this just gives you an idea of how different they can be in size to kind of provide for that food chain then you know, these are getting bigger and feeding the fish and also eventually coming out of the water and continuing to feed. Um, dragonflies are just one of my favorite macroinvertebrates. And just a fun fact about dragonflies that they are one of the most voracious and successful predators of any animal or insect. They can catch and kill over 90% of the prey that they engage because they have almost a 360 degree field of view. They can see almost all the way around them 
at any given time. So I'm going to peek back in real quick and see how our comments are doing. If you guys have any questions about that little spiel there. Interesting. Oops, lost a leg. Yes. So you saw one of the uh, one of the mayfly nymphs that we were looking at was missing a leg, and that likely is um, because it escaped being food at some point. So something may have tried to eat it, and it was able to um, to get away. Really quickly, you guys, I just wanted to make sure that um, I'm still coming in for you. I just am looking at our live stream feed here, and for me, it's frozen. So um, I'm kind of balancing a lot of technology on one device right now. So I just wanted to make sure that this is still coming through for you guys um, and that you can still see and hear and the videos are playing okay for you. I'll check back in in just a moment. Um, so I did wanna talk about some of the adaptations of these creatures, because this is not something I felt that I covered very much on Wednesday and is one of my favorite things about these organisms. So um, let's see if we can find a little bit better clip of one of the mayfly. That's the caddisfly, there's the mayfly. So one of the things I think is really cool about each of these organisms is the way that they um, all kind of have their gills different. So this mayfly right here, do you see that kind of flicking going on on the sides? Those are the, its gills. So it has gills that it's able to kind of um, flex around in the water and move around so that it can breathe. Um, I don't have a good video clip of a damselfly, but they're a very similar shape to the mayfly where they've kind of got these um, six legs and elongated body. But what's really interesting about the damselfly is if you look on the mayfly, you can see these kind of three things coming off of its tail. That's where a damselfly's gills would be. So they basically have three long gills hanging off the end of their tail and they drop those as they do their emergence. So as they leave water and um, go through their their final molt to become an adult flying around damselfly, which is very similar to a dragonfly, they're just a little bit smaller. Um, they actually drop their gills in, off because they don't need them anymore because they're coming out of the water. Something else that I think is really cool about mayflies is um, they do have these three little things coming off of their tails and those are used um, in a, a study I read that they, they studied how mayfly use um, this part of their body and these are called Circe. And they're used essentially in two different ways. And one of which is they use it as a sensory organ so that any movement in the water near them, they're able to kind of detect that and um, get away. So they use it to kind of sense the movements around them in the water and to escape. But the other way that they use it is as a defense mechanism and it's called scorpioning when they do that. So um, it's in this clip towards the end. I'm not sure exactly where in the clip, but you see one of the mayfly um, flick up their Circe as a, def a defense mechanism. Let's see if we can find, I believe it's that big mayfly in there. There we go, you see them start to kind of pull it up there a little bit. So called scorpioning. Um, and you can imagine why, because they, they pull it up like a scorpion. Just an incredible adaptation by them. And again, you can see the, the stone flies in this sample kind of crawling around one of the more sensitive organisms. And unfortunately, we didn't get a really good look at a, um, a dragonfly or a damselfly nymph, but essentially also baby versions of um, those, adult, those adult insects. All right. Check back in on our comments here and see if we have anything else coming in. All right. Oh, great, great, excellent. So I have a question here that says, how big is that one? Um, uh, not sure which one you were talking about, but most of what we're looking at is really small. They all fall into this group of being macro invertebrates, which as the video explained, um, macro is anything that's big enough that you can see it with your naked eye. So without using help of a microscope or um, any sort of technology, you're able to see these things. And that's, um, that's one part that makes it so fun is that you're able to kind of um, look into a stream. And if you spend long enough looking at any one of these, you know, the streams, the banks, oftentimes on sticks and logs in the stream that you'll start to see these things. And the more you look for them, the more you'll start to notice them. 
So I got you, Amanda. You're you're wondering about damselflies. Um, so all of these organisms vary in size. They start small, and as they molt, they have to shed those exoskeletons in order for themselves to grow. And um, that's how you can tell they're getting older. The big difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly is that a damselfly is a little bit smaller than a dragonfly. And again, they vary in size, um, but it's not much longer than your pinky, and definitely a lot skinnier than your pinky. They're kind of a long, uh, a long, thin insect. The big difference between damselflies and dragonflies is that damselflies hold their wings up when they're resting, and dragonflies leave their wings down when they're resting. Robin was wondering if they regrow their legs like other animals do. Um, to my knowledge, they do not regrow their limbs or legs or anything like that. Um, they do molt. So if they have any kind of just external damage on their exoskeleton, that that could repair with a, with a fresh molt and, a, and regrowing a new exoskeleton. But um, I don't think that they regrow appendages like um, some, some amphibians do. Great question. Well, all right, you guys, um, if we don't have any more questions, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. But I really appreciate you all so much for tuning in. And thanks for joining me for a little bit of our um, a kind of non-traditional <laughs> program for our 3 p.m. live stream today. Um, this is kind of, uh, you know, as we mentioned, we are all practicing social distancing as well. Um, we're trying to work from home as much as we can to limit our contact within the offices. We're sanitizing all of our equipment and things like that. So. Uh, me broadcasting from home today is kind of a product of that uh, working from home rather than in the office and it just being such a rainy day i didn't want to get this technology wet um, by showing you this video outside so i really appreciate you guys all kind of sticking through our modified live stream today um, keep in mind we've got these going at three o'clock every single day so if you really wanted to get out into a park today and we didn't quite do that for you today tune in tomorrow um, we'll be out in a park broadcasting and, and sharing some new some other great information so if you guys do have any more questions about macroinvertebrates, plankton, prairie creek, anything like that, I am I I love macroinvertebrates, um, maybe a little too much. They they are just get me wildly excited. I think it's it's so incredible that there's I had no idea when I first started learning about them that there was anything like this living in the water. So um, it kind of opened a whole new door of of learning about things for me. So very special. But thank you guys all so much for tuning in and letting me share this with you. Um, again, it is really special to me. And it, it's, it's excellent that you guys are tuning in and learning about them as well. We're really excited to have you here and um, we really appreciate you guys tuning in time after time, um, especially those of you who have been watching everyone and also watched me do this on Wednesday. Thanks for coming back and hopefully you learned something a little new and a little bit different. Really quick as a treat, I will show you um, my gross home office. Ta -da, the illusion is broken. Well, thank you guys all so much again for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow at three o'clock for another one of our live streams. Thank you guys all so much. We really appreciate you and we'll see you soon.